salary compensation is not the whole picture. Well, Allison, I keep telling them, <laughs> stop worrying so much about the salary. The devil's in the details. The benefits are where it's at, but not just ask what they are, but ask how to utilize them. Who can utilize them when and for what reason? All right, everyone. Um, we are continuing our series with Provider Solutions and Development. And this time we're going to be talking about how to find a job, but specifically not just how to find a job, but when you already identified some hospitals, a clinic, a private practice that you want to work at, what about when you go through the interview process, whether it's live or I have to assume now, Allison, the majorities are uh, virtual now. But when you go through your interview process, what kind of questions should you be asking um, specifically, not like what's my salary or what's like the culture like there, but more in-depth questions where um, you may feel a little bit shy. You may feel a little bit nervous to ask these type of questions. And I'm talking about questions that are related around the diversity equity and inclusion space, um, and maybe even some other things that, you know, we all don't necessarily think about. So Allison Hollingsworth, she is a physician and provider recruiter with Provider Solutions and Development. Welcome to Docs Outside the Box. How you doing? Doing great. Happy to be here. I'm excited to be here because this is a topic that, you know, I've been doing interviews literally almost on a yearly basis because I work locums. So I'll go from one hospital to another hospital. I know the type of questions that I'm going to ask, um, but for the most part, still, I don't know if my qu my questions are really consequential or if they're really going to persuade me one way or the other, other, leave it to you like that. But these questions, this topic is something that I think nowadays a lot more people have a lot more weight, have a lot more um, say so as to what type of organization do they want to align themselves, particularly an organization that may or may not have a dedication to diversifying the workforce, um, maybe some things around equity as well as inclusion. So. That's what you're here is to help us kind of figure out some type of questions to ask if that's something that's a priority for you. So how about we jump right into it? Right. So we we're at a point where, you know, a, a candidate has found maybe several hospitals or several pr uh, private practices. They've invited them for an interview. They've asked like the generalized questions and so forth. Um, but there are some interests that they have in certain spaces, like when exactly in the interview process or even in the entire job search process, should they be asking these type of questions um, that are kind of, I guess, outside the box, non-traditional, so to speak? I think it can depend a bit on the type of practice, whether it's a small private practice, whether it's a large hospital system, I do think that can play a factor in the timing. What I always encourage people to do is you can ask from day one, and if your recruiter or if someone from human resources doesn't know, we will help get that answer. Most of the time, I would suggest asking when you speak with like a medical director or a CMO or someone from maybe operations side, a lot of times they have a lot more in-depth information that they can provide or can make those decisions themselves if it's not something that is in our standard contract. Yeah. You know, I, I think that for folks who may roll their eyes at this episode, this is really a make or break type of question, a make or break type of issue, because I think in my experience, the majority of people who leave their jobs, they don't leave it for the patient population. They don't leave it for, you know, specifically what's going on in terms of resources at their hospital. It's mainly interpersonal relationships as well as some other um, initiatives that you may or may not believe that the hospital is big into. One of the topics that we're going to cover today is actually generational conflict, right? Specifically residents who are coming out and may be of a specific generation. You're jumping into a private practice or a hospital employee position, and the majority of, of the doctors are, you know, Gen Xers or, you know, baby boomers and the way they practice medicine is completely different than the way how millennials and even Gen Ys practice medicine. How do you handle that? And as a matter of fact, why don't we just stop talking around a subject like that's big, right? So I'll just give a quick example. Like guys, like I remember finishing my fellowship going into uh, my first job 
And my partners were in their 50s or 60s. Some of them were divorced, but the majority of them had multiple kids. They had stakes in a whole bunch of different things that I didn't have a stake in. I just had student loans and that was it. So a little bit, uh, there was a lot of like differences that we had in how we should practice and so forth. I didn't like 24 hour shifts. They like 24 hour shifts. Um, you know, and I think oftentimes I found myself a little bit hesitant to ask questions, mainly because I felt as though some of those questions or maybe some of the analysis behind those questions would be looked upon uh, and used against me. Either I don't have enough knowledge or I don't know what I'm doing or I'm insecure and what have you. And this happens uh, quite often, I think. So I just want people to know that, you know, when you're getting into a new practice, it's great to bring that fresh blood, but also at the same time, it's very important to understand that your ideas and what you've learned in residency and fellowship can oftentimes be in conflict with someone who's been out of training and maybe out of the educational system for a significant period of time. So Allison, let's talk about this. What kind of questions should someone ask in the interview to make sure that there's, you know, some type of interplay here, intersection here that this could be handled? I think one that immediately comes to mind when talking about generational conflict would be asking, how does the team or department handle conflict resolution? Mm. Who is involved? What steps are taken? We want to make sure that each side is heard, valued, listened to, um, and you don't necessarily want to just act, you know, right away with no research and no care put into it. So, it's a very simple question that I think might actually throw off some of the people interviewing you. It's probably not one commonly asked, and it's okay if you're a little uncomfortable asking it. I think it shows that you are mature enough to know that conflict arises in every single workplace, whether it's a disagreement in how a patient is being treated, whether it's a disagreement between policy or procedure, it's going to happen. So how about we all get prepared and know what the process is? Are you aware of like any of the different types of styles or different types of solutions that some practices may do when there's conflict issues like this? On a very high level, not as much um, kind of in the granular detail. Well, you know, because I think that, you know, there could be differences in terms of medication. There could be differences as to when you want to discharge someone within trauma. There could be a difference as to when you should trach someone versus when you should not. Someone may try to force you to do something that you may not want to do. And I think that yeah, it's really interesting. I didn't think about that in terms of, OK, like we're going to come at an impasse. Ultimately, the decision is going to be mine, but um, there are times when we share patients. What's going to happen? What is the process that's in place to make sure that, hey, whatever solution that's figured out, you know, it's arbitrated correctly, both sides are listened to, and then, you know, a solution that both parties can agree to. That's just something that we're not used to as residents. You know, that's something that we're not mm -hmm. used to as fellows. We're just told what to do. And if it's in agreement with our, our attendings, then, you know, that's the only way that's going to go. So that's, that's something that I think would throw off a lot of folks. But um, what if they don't have an answer for that? What, what would you say in, in that situation? Is there like a question B in that same line of questioning after that? I think you can kind of pull a reverse card on them. Um, as people interviewing for jobs were always asked, give us an example of a time you had a conflict with a coworker. You can ask those questions back to the team and have them give an example of when there may have been a dispute or disagreement between two of the members of the team. They don't have to share names. They don't have to go into, you know, those really personal details, but they should be able to provide an example and show the outcome, what happened based mm. on their actions. Okay. And this is, we're saying this is really at the, this is taking place at the interview um, like I said, virtually or in person, I'm, I'm assuming, right? Yes. So I'd say this would be with the interview with the team or medical leadership, um, not necessarily like an HR or recruiter interview. 
Yeah. Once again, guys, like I said, I'm learning just the same way you guys are learning, listening to this, because as a locums doc, I just, I rarely ask these type of questions. It's literally, I'm always the type of person who's like, look, I'll see it when I believe it. So when I get on boots on the ground, then I'm going to believe everything that you guys say in terms of your mission statement and so forth. So let's move into the realm of diversity, inclusion, and equity, DEI initiatives. How about that? How, did, how does someone bring up a question with that? Because there are doctors who are working uh, with various uh, marginalized communities and may want to know what or how a hospital aligns with that. So I think there's a few different approaches. Some people love to be very direct and to the point and simply ask what is the organization or practice doing to increase health equity and address DEI initiatives. You can ask very point blank, or you can ask questions that get at the same answer, but maybe aren't as direct. I think of things of asking what the access to medical translators is like. Is it reliable? Oh. Is it a dependable? Um, does the organization take part in the healthcare equity or healthcare equality index survey? If so, how did they score? Um, there's a few options of how direct you want to be. And I also like to tell people it's okay if you're uncomfortable asking them. Um, that's These are not your traditional interview questions that we've been taught since high school. They're going to be a little uncomfortable until you get used to asking them. And here's some statistics that we know about. It looks like diverse candidates are nine times more likely to an accept to accept an offer at a diverse organization. So for those organizations that are looking <clears throat> to diversify the field, you know, they're going to want to ask some of these questions. That is something that I think is really on the minds of millennials and Gen Yers. I think Gen, Gen Xers, someone like me, I think about it, but I'm not trained to ask those type of questions. Right. And then another stat is 60 percent of millennial physicians anticipate generational conflict. So what that means is generational conflict is you're just fresh out of, of, of training and maybe there is an issue between you and one of your, um, you know, one of your partners who may be 10 years, 20 years in the game and y'all just don't agree. So it happens, y'all. It really happens. Um, you know, the, the questions that I have also is, I think we were discussing this before we came on the show. You mentioned... Um, what kind of work may be planned in the future within the realm of DEI? What kind of questions or what kind of answers should you expect in that type of situation? Are you like, should that be something that you're saying? Okay. Like if a company says no, then, you know, that's the end or should you like talk us through that, that process? I think if a company says no or an organization, it could lead to a follow-up question of, are you looking for someone to lead that work? If that's a passion of yours, they may have the funds and the resources, but they may not have the people to help drive it. So if that's something that interests you, you could definitely ask that. If not, you could ask things of if you don't have any active initiatives that you're working towards, how are you maintaining equity amongst your organization? Um, do you perform regular compensation reviews? How is compensation calculated? How are benefits decided? Um, it can be completely HR focused in that total rewards, or it can be more broad and touch on diversity and inclusion. How are you making sure patients are having all of their needs met? Yeah, I think that question about the access to medical translators, that's something that is... I didn't even think about that's really dope, actually. So, you know, there are uh, hospitals that are bought out by certain religious organizations. Um, you know, we got a lot of stuff going on right now. So in terms of asking questions about restrictions and things like continuing education benefits like CME and so forth, how do you bring that up? Yes, I think that is a question that should be asked in every interview. Um, especially depending on specialty and type of practice, you should know what you are restricted from doing or performing. And you should also be aware of any special approvals that you might have to receive if something needs to be done. And then you should always ask about benefits when you're interviewing for a position. 
salary compensation is not the whole picture. Um, some places I keep have telling some... people, Allison, I keep telling them, <laughs> stop worrying too much about the salary. The devil's the in benefits, the details. Yes, the benefits are where it's at and people really have to evaluate them. But not just ask what they are, but ask how to utilize them. Who can utilize them when and for what reason? Um, you mentioned continuing education. I would highly recommend asking, are there any restrictions on what type of education you can use those funds or days off for? Think of continuing education for transgender care, mm -hmm. continuing education for women's health, things mm -hmm. like that immediately come to mind and some places might have restrictions on what you can use your education funds on. Yeah, you know, I, I like the way in which you're presenting these questions because you're you're giving us like the overall 30,000 foot view, but you're also giving us like ways that you can ask this question that they have to answer, um, but you can either focus on HR. It's not really like a direct conflict type of question, right? And I appreciate that. And I think the listeners will appreciate that. Now, there was one thing that we talked about is, do leaders receive training on how to limit the impact of their biases? Fair? Or how often is this question being asked? I would say it's definitely being asked more often over the last few years. Um, I think we all can be aware that we have our own biases. That's part of being human. However, especially in a leadership role, you need to be aware of your biases and know how to mitigate the impacts of them. And so many organizations are now doing mandatory leadership trainings um, on how to be aware of your implicit bias and how to prevent that affecting those that report to you. And I think that's a completely fair question to ask and to even ask if it's an opportunity for you to take part in that training. Even if you're not in a leadership role, you are leading your patients towards better health. You need to be aware of your biases. You need to be aware of how to limit the impact on your patients. So I'm very old school, um, but I remember coming out, I wanted some mentorship, but I was afraid to ask. And one of the, when I was where I work at currently, one of the newest fellows asked, is there any specific mentorship that's going on with any of the attendings and me that could occur, you know, in a very, um, uh, in a very, in a way that's just fruitful. And I was like, oh man, I didn't even think about ever asking that question, but it just is a sign of signs that have changed. So fair question or not a fair question? Because I think this particularly, particularly in the procedural, um, uh, specialties where you have to operate and so forth. I'm assuming this is a question that should be asked. Yes. I think you should definitely ask about mentorship, who would be your mentor, what they can do in that role. Are they shadowing you? Are you shadowing them? Asking about onboarding. Um, we don't want to just throw someone into a position that they're not comfortable in. We need to make sure that they have that onboarding time to get adjusted and have that mentorship to be able to be successful in that role. Okay. Uh, next question is um, connecting with your fellow colleagues um, or like resources. What do you mean by that? So if you're in a larger organization, it can be really easy to feel like you're kind of siloed or maybe that you only know your department. Um, so I encourage people to ask about employee resource groups. A lot of companies oh, now have those where there are groups where you can connect with people of similar backgrounds, similar lifestyles, similar interests. Um, so I know, for example, we have one for single parents where they can gather, I believe it's once a month virtually, connect, really just have that support system at work that also supports them in their personal life. Um, we also have like a Black Caregivers resource group where you can gather, you can talk about issues that are bothering you. It's a very judgment-free zone. You can talk about initiatives that you might want to see at the organization. And typically they're very um, laid back. Um, they're not recorded. They're free-flowing conversation between colleagues. And if there's something that does need to be brought up, a lot of times there's a few, depending on the size of the group, designated people that can bring that back to leadership. Um, but it never has names attached or who said it or what led to it. 
Um, so they're really great resources for kind of finding your community. You know, I can tell you right now, like anybody coming out from this show, um, if you're asking these type of questions or taking one piece of information from this, like, I think this puts you on a different level. Like, I think they will look at you in a different light more so than just the average candidate, specifically if it's a very competitive field, right? Because now they're like, well, this person is on their P's and Q's and this person for the most part appears to want to have a very um, committed stake in being here um, because you're taking the time to really ask some like under the surface type of questions. I could tell you once again, I've said this multiple times, I was not thinking about these questions whatsoever. And I do think that, it, you know, in today's time and age, it's great that these these questions can be asked or that an organization um, should be prepared to answer these type of questions or at least um, have this type of discussion with with candidates. So is there any other type of questions that I missed or any other questions that you would say? Think about this if you haven't been thinking about this already. Um, another one that can kind of be a less direct question um, but really dig at some important topics is asking organizations, and this would probably be more of a question for like a director of operations or someone on the operations or administrative side, asking how are goals set for the organization? Um, and a wonderful mentor that I have had the pleasure of taking their classes recommends using the Smarty Goals method. I heard of smart of, goals, but not smarty. Yeah. Most of us know smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time bound. Um, but then we add an IE. Is the goal inclusive and is the goal equitable? Hmm. Do people have the equitable chance of achieving that goal? If not, what measures are being put in place so that people aren't left behind? Mm. You know, I was uh, recently at the National Residency Matching Program. Me and Dr. Renee were talking about uh, financial literacy in medical school as well as in residency. And we were talking specifically about uh, the big wage gap between women that occurs. And, you know, if you look at a 20 year career, that wage gap decreases as you get towards the end of the career. But the big issue is the beginning where like possibly no negotiations are occurring on one part versus the other, or just in general, just there's a pay gap just out, out of the blue. Uh, but one person had mentioned, like, for example, um, trying to increase the amount of surgeries that's going on, right, in a department, and then also paying your or giving up an appropriate compensation to your surgeons. Well, if most of the surgeons are operating during the day um, and then there is an ability to make compensation after hours by doing after hour surgery or surgery that just requires you to be off shift and you would get compensated more, this surgeon who is a woman and who has, who's married and has children, she's saying that like if you are in that demographic, it makes it very difficult to get additional compensation when you have to be a provider at home also or be a caregiver at home, i.e. be a mom at home and you're the one who's primarily doing these other things. And I was like, huh, I didn't even think about that, you know? Um, so that, I think that's where the inclusive and equitable uh, part comes in. Let's increase surgeries, but if you're increasing it in a way that probably a good portion of your workforce can't participate in, how equitable are we? So. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads directly into asking not only what is the compensation, but how is it calculated? What methodologies are used um, that's almost a bigger picture than what is the compensation. Is it a tier structure based on years of experience? Is it something that is calculated um, or fully RVU based? Those can really change what people make. Can you school these guys and let them know that the the questions that they ask or the more questions they ask doesn't really or should not have a negative outlook on them? Because I think a lot of folks are like, that's great, but I can't ask those questions in my interview. Can you can you let them know about this? Yes, I highly encourage you to not be afraid to ask questions. And don't be afraid at how many you're asking, especially if they're good questions. Um, and like I said, you might stump some people and they may not have answers. It's okay to also follow up with an email after your interview. Mm -hmm. If you want to give them some time 
to think about their response and think about their answer or provide resources. Um, I'd say probably nine out of the 10 physicians that I speak with typically send a list of questions after their interview that maybe they didn't think about during it or they didn't know how to ask it or didn't feel like the appropriate time. And then I can answer them to the best of my ability and also have other teammates, director of operations, chief medical officers chime in on ones that might be better answered by them. Hmm. So listen, guys, um, this was a just a little snippet of you know, the questions as well as the education that you can get working with provider solutions and development, physician and recruiters, similar to Allison, um, Allison Hollingsworth, by the way, uh, is, which is her full name. So Allison, if folks want to connect with you, if someone is looking for a job and they want to be able to ask questions just like this, or, you know, in general, they just feel like looking for a job is like this big opaque thing that they can't see through and they're needing help or some mentorship. How do they get in contact with you? Feel free to email me, first name dot last name at psdrecruit.org, or of course, go to our website, psdconnect.org. There it is. So now we just, just so to give people a timeline, we are in October now in terms of looking for a job. Are we, as someone who's looking for a job right now, is this behind the game? Or are they ahead of the game? Where are they at if they haven't really considered um either contacting um, an organization like yours or just they haven't even just started looking at jobs. They're waiting till January. Where, where are they at right now? I'd say it really depends on specialty and the location that you're looking for. Um, certain locations, as we know, fill up much faster than others. So if you're looking for that top tier, you know, award winning hospital location that has one opening a year, you might be a little behind, but the, not to say that you are out of the running or anything. I would just reach out sooner rather than later. Um, if you're still kind of figuring out what you're looking for, definitely reach out to us. Um, we do have resident advisors and fellows. You're more than welcome to use them <laughs> as well um, that can really help navigate that. They will speak with you. They'll see what you're interested in. They're not pushing a specific job or a specific location. They're really working with you of what, what's important to you. What are your values? What patients do you want to see? What community do you want to live in? And then they can help you narrow down your options. So if you're a little hesitant to officially apply to a position, please reach out to those advisors. Yeah, I love it. Allison, thank you very much. Allison Hollings work with Provider Solutions and Development. Guys, she's a physician and provider recruiter. There's a lot of education, a lot of mentorship, a lot of resources with Provider Solutions and Development. Make sure you click in the show notes for more information on that. We'll also have her contact information on how to get in contact with her. And Allison, you did great. Thank you for coming on Docs Outside the Box and giving us a little glimpse of some of the questions that we should be using to turn the tables on, on uh, <laughs> in the interview uh, process and get some of those answers that we just want to know. And letting folks know it's not just about salary and days off. It's about some other important things um, that we just are not thinking about. Thanks for having me. I hope to hear these questions being asked more. Awesome.